I've been thinking about this triad between place, terrain, territory for a number of years. I've written a little bit about this in a couple of articles <coughs> I've written about terrain. Uh, but this is the first time I really engage more deeply with the theoretical dimensions of this triad, uh, especially in connection with the climate crisis. So I'm look looking forward to the questions and the discussion. Wildfires have become one of the most potent, destructive, and unsettling materializations of the climate crisis. The elemental physicality of flames burning forests, homes, and infrastructures all over the world, and you're reducing them to ashes, rubble, and smoke, make apparent that while global warming is created by the human-made system, capitalism, it has a more than human power that can overwhelm human-made spatial configurations and radically affect places and territories. What Nigel Clark calls the inhuman nature of wildfires forces us, for this reason, to think about the spatiality of the climate crisis beyond the anthropocentrism of the most influential theories about places and territories, which despite their differences, tend to highlight how human actors create, experience, imagine, organize, disrupt, and fight over places and territories. That wildfires anywhere in the world mobilize the chemistry and physics of combustion through the conversions of heat, wind, and oxygen in their contact with flammable matter demands, in other words, a non-anthropocentric theory of terrain. Derived from the Latin word for earth, terra, terrain is the most material and textual concept we count on to name the forms and flows of any geography. Yet acknowledging this more than human dimension of terrain amid the climate crisis also requires recovering and rethinking the most important contributions of humanistic theories of place and territory. The reason is that the concept of place and territory are key to understanding how human actors, based on their senses of place and spatial configurations of power, experience and respond to disasters like wildfires. More importantly, analyzing the mutual entanglement between place, territory, and terrain is politically important because a project of radical decarbonization and climate justice necessarily entails creating uh, uh, new places and collective territories attuned, attuned to the rhythms of terrain. In this presentation, I propose a triad around place, territory, and terrain to better understand the spatiality of the climate crisis, and in particular, wildfires in the context of Canada, where I live, uh, but also the spatiality of the social movements fighting for climate justice worldwide. My main inspiration to explore this spatial triad has been Henri Lefebvre's argument in the production of space that capturing the multifaceted dimensions of space as simultaneously material, social, and experiential requires moving beyond the dualisms that have defined the rigid versions of the dialectic and of European philosophy. The most limiting of these dualisms is that between objectivist and subjectivist notions of space. Lefebvre argued that breaking from this dualism demands a triad that accounts for the fact that space is simultaneously perceived through material spatial practices, conceived intellectually through particular ideologies and, and what he calls representations of space, and lived through nonverbal symbols and signs that he called representational space. Lefebvre's thinking on this triad is as groundbreaking as it is meandering and often inconsistent. For elsewhere in the book, he invoked a different type of triad involving physical space, social space, and mental space. Lefebvre doesn't really explain how these different triads intersect with each other, and he also writes, for instance, that natural spaces, uh, about natural spaces to refer to terrain features such as mountains, which he sees also as part of physical space. I will return to the question of how natural spaces can be subsumed within the place, territory, terrain triad later on. Despite these inconsistencies, Lefebvre's re rethinking of space through what Schmidt calls a triadic dialectic was highly influential. In the 1990s, geographer Edward Sawyer drew from Lefebvre to propose a different triad formed by what he called first space, uh, he meant by this uh, material space, second space, 
I, which he uh, defined as ideas about space, and finally a third space by which he meant a hybrid space, both real and imagined. Uh, more recently, Wakan proposed a trialectic that builds on Bourdieu's work and that argues for a distinction between what he calls symbolic space, social space, and physical space. Claiming this triad uh, as unrelated, uh, so claiming that this triad is unrelated to Lefebvre's and focusing on urban space, Wakan argues that these spaces have relative autonomy from each other while, and I quote, like tectonic plates, they constantly rub into each other, unquote. I've been greatly influenced uh, and inspired by these efforts to move beyond spatial binaries, and I will engage with some of these ideas uh, in another section. Yet what in my mind limits the analytic power of the triads proposed by Lefebvre, Soya, and Wakant, especially given the raw materiality of the climate crisis, is that they all are built around the most abstract and immaterial of all of our spatial categories space. The term space is still, I think, heuristically useful to name the simultaneity of the world's multiplicity, or the sphere of, of coexistence heterogeneity, as proposed, for instance, by Doreen Massey. But I also agree with the many authors who have argued that, that the disembodied evocations of the word space fail to do justice to the corporeal nature of human spatial experiences. Albert Einstein himself argued that we should entirely shun the idea of space because of its vagueness. And as Tim Ingold put it in a chapter entitled Against Space, and I quote, of all the terms we use to describe the world we inhabit, it is the most abstract, the most empty, the most detached from the realities of life and experience, unquote. In the case of the triads advanced by Lefebvre, Soya, and Wakant, because of their attachment to space as their guiding principle, they all need to qualify each of these spaces through composite, jargon-heavy concepts, physical space, mental space, first space, third space, and so forth, that are disconnected from, the everyday, from everyday language and from people's tactile and social engagement with the effective and ever-shifting materiality of the world. These triads, in other words, end up doing what Lefebvre actually warned against, against, creating an abstraction. For as he put it, and I quote, the perceived, conceived, lived triad loses all force if it is treated as an abstract model, unquote. In what follows, I propose to rethink the triadic spatial thinking opened up by Lefebvre by focusing on the most established concepts we already count on to name human spatiality as experiential, contested, and material, place, territory, and terrain. And this is no longer Lefebvre's triad, but an altogether different one. For there is a, a no one-to-one -one correspondence between place, territory, and terrain, and the perceived, conceived, lived, or between mental space, social place, space, and physical space. There is one key insight from Lefebvre that guides my own work, which is that what unites these different dimensions of a triad is that humans experience them through the body. The summer of 2023 was the hottest on record, and Canada in particular was hit by the most widespread and destructive wave of forest fires in its history. The government of the province of British Columbia, where I live, I live in Vancouver, distributed on social media a poster with the headline, wildfires threaten the places we love. It was illustrated, as you can see, with a photo of two firefighters in a forest, a man and a woman seemingly in a break from fighting forest fires and defending those places we love from destruction. I will, I will return to this poster and its territorial dimensions later on. But this image and this text highlight the first spatial dimension of the climate crisis, which is that the atmospheric turbulences of global warming indeed threaten to destroy the places humans inhabit, experience, and love, from homes, towns, and forests to sites of cultural, religious, or political significance. Place is indeed the first moment I examine in our triad because it is indeed one of the most widespread and potent terms people use to name their spatial orientation, 
location, sense of belonging, and in general, the where of their experience. Is it also a key spatial concept uh, in the academy and has therefore been analyzed in philosophy, geography, anthropology, and other fields as constitutive to being human? As authors influenced by phenomenology like Casey uh, and Basso, among many others, have argued, humans never experience space in the abstract or as a purely physical configuration. People only experience places apprehended through their bodies, cultural sensibilities, and memories. This humanist understanding of place is key to make sense of the spatiality of wildfires. For these fires can be particularly unsettling of social experiences of place precisely because their disruptive physicality can profoundly affect the body's spatial sensorium. And you don't need to be close to wildfires to note their spatial effects. In Vancouver, where I live, most people's senses of place, including mine, uh, are transformed by the arrival of smoke of fires that may happen hundreds of kilometers away. When shrouded in smoke, the city becomes a different place. The air smells of burnt matter, and in breathing particulate matter, many people soon experience sore throats. The, brown, the brownish air feels thick. Amid the toxic haze, many people simply withdraw from the streets or wear masks. The urban rhythms slow down, moods change. But not everybody is equally affected. For many people experience the same place differently depending on their class, racial, or political positioning. The affective atmospheres on the streets and in conversations therefore combine, on the one hand, the apprehension of grief of many people with, on the other hand, the disregard of others who go about their lives seemingly undisturbed. In this multifaceted place, indigenous people experience the smoke as yet another manifestation of colonial violence on a place they feel profoundly connected with and that they experience through their memory of survivance. Yet in areas near to the flames of wildfires, places can certainly be transformed much more drastically and be burned down and physically destroyed. <clears throat> in the summer of, of this year, thousands of houses and structures were incinerated and the threat of the fires triggered dozens of thousands of evacuations, both vol voluntary and mandatory all over Canada, a territorial dim dimension I discussed early, uh, later. And this takes me to another crucial dimension of places highlighted by authors like Doreen Massey and Tim Ingold, that places are not enclosed or inward-looking containers, but rather open-ended nodes, points of conversions that, as Heidegger noted, gather imaginary relations and patterns of movement. And as nodes, places are therefore socially and materially interconnected with other places near or distant. The novel nature of places becomes apparent when wildfires trigger massive evacuations, as people are forced to abandon their, their familiar places to move elsewhere. In his book Fire Weather, author and journalist John Violent interviewed firefighters who fought the wildfires that in May 2016 destroyed much of the town of Fort McMurray in Alberta, Western Canada, which is the capital of Canada's infamous tar sands. The fires were, were one of the most destructive on record and forced the evacuation of 80,000 people, the largest evacuation ever generated by wildfires in North America. The riveting, riveting accounts by these firefighters gives us a window into the type of place a city becomes when it is abandoned amid wildfires and also of the fraught and intensely disorienting sense of place created by the flames and the ruination they create. Because of the unprecedented speed, ferocity, and destructiveness of the fires, many firefighters declared, and I quote, that no one has ever seen anything like this. The power of the fire felt to them so monstrous that many describe it as a feral creature, and the local fire chief called it the beast. The, direction of th the reduction of thousands of homes to ashes and the ambient heat and smoke created a widespread sense of disorientation among firefighters whose home was Fort McMurray, but who no longer recognized the place they were once familiar with. Because of the smoke and the disappearance of landmarks, one firefighter felt, and I quote, 
that he was becoming a stranger in his own town, unquote. This spatial estrangement uh, was exacerbated by the fact that during daytime, the black smoke was so thick that it totally blocked off the sun and it felt like nighttime. Amid the intense heat and the smoke, a firefighter declared, it was like sensory deprivation and sensory overload both at the same time, unquote. The fire's intense soundscape also added to the disorientation, which including the roaring of the fire itself, described as the roar of a freight train and the sound of houses detonating. And I quote uh, another fighter fighter here, you're hearing explosions pop after pop after pop, propane tanks are going, tires are popping, gas tanks in garages, compressed air tanks, unquote. It took several weeks for the fire to finally recede in the town. The place with thousands of homes destroyed remained deserted for a full month. The reconstruction of Fort McMurray began shortly thereafter, but the place is no longer the same. Thousands of former residents never returned. The effects of the 2016 wildfires remind, remind us that places, as argued by Edward Casey and also uh, by Doreen Massey, are not simply spatial phenomena, but spatial temporal events. Nodal arrangements whose form and cultural flavors shift over time and that may come to an end. And amid the climate crisis, the threat of their destruction makes apparent the finitude of any place, be that a house or, or a town. Nothing makes the eventual nature, uh, 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 the eventual nature of places more apparent than their rubble, which in turn becomes a new type of place, but it's also the reminder of places that no longer exist. These various examples show that a phenomenological a nodal approach to places is crucial to capture the embodied, cultural situated uh, ways in which people experience wildfires and, in general, the effects of the climate crisis. But the spatiality of wildfires has territorial and material dimensions that cannot be fully accounted for by the idea of place. The concept of place uh, does evoke a particular materiality and the potential for political significance. The case of struggle for the defense of places threatened by encroachment or the occupation of squares by multitudes shows, as Kimberly Peters argues, and I quote, that place is not unlike territory, unquote. Yet the notion of territory alludes to spatial political dimensions that escape the idea of place, for it brings to light that places are immersed in wider spatial constellations involving various forms of control appropriation, contestation, and violence. <clears throat> or to return to the case of the climate crisis, places affected by wildfires are also part of territorial and juridical formations of governance that deploy particular strategies and resources to try to fight the spread of fire and in some cases control people's movement. The work on territory is vast and reveals first that territories are not necessarily human. Indigenous people worldwide often associate particular territories with the more than human and sentient power of mountains to influence events around them, as the work of Marisol de la Cadena, for instance, shows. Ecologists, in turn, have long analyzed the territoriality of non-human animals. But for the most part, the work on territory has focused on the spatiality of sovereignty created by human actors, from state to non-state actors. This means that multiple forms of territories overlap and coexist at various scales. The ongoing existence of indigenous territories within nation states, which Audra Simpson examines as nested forms of sovereignty, along with the territories created, for instance, by drug cartels and the transnational forms of territoriality created by globalized corporations and their supply chains show that we live in a world defined by what Rogelio Hesbert calls multi-territorialities. Yet at the same time, as Saskia Sassen shows, nation states and their internal jurisdictions continue being very significant territorial forces in shaping places and local and regional spatial organizations. But before analyzing how these territorial dimensions and conflicts are relevant to examine wildfires in Canada, 
It is important to further refine the, the, the idea of territory along the lines of the re-elaboration of the concept by Stuart Eldon. Eldon draws from Foucault's work to propose to conceptualize territories not as areas that can be represented on a map, but rather as political technologies through which political actors, and primarily the state, seek to establish control over terrain. During the wildfires that every summer <coughs> affect many areas of Canada, the main territorial technology deployed by state agencies at the provincial and federal levels involves firefighting crews as well as myriad vehicles, planes, and helicopters. This is why the photo I discussed earlier showing two fighter fighters in a forest is not simply about place, but also about territory. Clearly in the fact that the female fighter, uh, fighter fighter on the photo displays a Canadian flag in her uniform. In fact, this photo was posted online by the Twitter account of the government of British Columbia with a text that is also a, a notable territorial gesture. BC is working with fire experts to help prevent wildfires. How can you help? Travel responsibly and follow bans and alerts. This line announces that the provincial government and fire experts are the main territorial actors seeking to prevent wildfires, but also interpolate citizens to do their part by behaving responsibly and obeying the state's bans and alerts and its territorial practices. <clears throat> what this message also does is hiding the provincial government's role in aggressively supporting fossil fuel extraction and the expansion of pipelines in, ac in accentuating the conditions that create these fires in the first place. But another and more assertive technology of state territoriality during the wildfires are the evacuation orders and the ban of non-essential travel in areas of intense fire activity enforced by the police on road blockades. In contrast to the deployment of firefighting crews, these territorial technologies seek to regulate the patterns of movement and mobility in and between different places. This was already clear uh, uh, in 2016 in the mandatory evacuation of the 80,000 uh, residents of Fort McMurray, but also surfaced again this past summer when an unprecedented fire season led to several mandatory evacuations in Western Canada. Most notably of the 20,000 residents of the city of Yellowknife in the Northwestern Territories, and also of 35,000 people who fled their homes in several areas of Southern British Columbia particularly near Kelowna, the largest city in the interior of British Columbia. The fires in this regard not only unsettled senses of place, but also activated the top-down territorial practices. Given that in Canada, provincial and federal territorialities overlap with indigenous territories as part of a fraught multi-territoriality, these mandatory evacuation orders have been a source of conflict. A notable incident involved the 2017 wildfires in the interior of British Columbia, when the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, or RCMP, sought to enforce an, ev an evacuation order in an indigenous community of the Sleek Cot First Nation. The local indigenous leader resisted the order and claimed that their unceded indigenous territory gave them the right to implement their own emergency responses. This led to a tense standoff that lasted for weeks with the police imposing roadblocks to limit the mobility of seal cut fire crews and community members. This ter territorial conflict made the community feel that the fire awakened us about the ongoing, ongoing colonial habits through which the Canadian state downplays and fails to recognize the persistence of indigenous claims to territory and sovereignty. A further territorial dimension of the wildfires in Canada is that their smoke promptly crossed national borders. In June 2023, smoke from fires in Canada's east uh, coast spread south and enveloped several major cities in the United States. For a few days, New York City had the worst air quality in the world and was immersed in an orange haze. The smoke altered local senses of place and made many people stay indoors and wear masks uh, on the streets. Others felt that this was Canadian smoke that was threatening U.S. national sovereignty. 
The right-wing tabloid, the New York Post, ran as headline, Blame Canada. Canuck wildfires plunge New York City into eerie, smoky hell. Representative Marjorie Greene, one of the most outspoken figures of the far right of the Republican Party, posted on Twitter a video of, the, of a New York bridge shrouded in smoke, and she wrote, New York has the worst air quality in history due to wildfires in climate cult Canada. Commenting on these debates, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, or CBC, ran a headline on its website that said, Our smoke, their skies. Noting how the smoke of those fires and even the atmosphere and the sky were experienced through nationalistic sense of place. These various examples from Canada and the United States show how places and territories are affected by climate events, but also how human actors respond to these events in particular ways by drawing, among other factors, from their sense of place and territorial allegiances. But the fact that the physics of heat, fire, and smoke transcends places and territories takes us to the third and perhaps most complex of the three concepts in this spatial triad, terrain, by which I mean the material forms, bodies, flows, and atmospheres that make up all places and territories on planet Earth, and that therefore include mountains, rivers, and heat waves as much as the built environment that defines urban centers, towns, and infrastructures. Stuart Alden rightly knows that the old equation of terrain with landforms is problematic because it leaves out material components such as the atmosphere and bodies of water that are inseparable from land. Hence the importance of an expanded definition of terrain that accounts for the voluminous, ever-shifting multiplicity of the earth. But as, I've, uh, as I have argued in, in a commentary on Eldon's work, this also means addressing the fact that all living bodies, including humans, do not act in terrain, but are rather part of terrain. All living bodies, in this regard, are porous entities that in breathing and ingesting water and nutrients permanently engage in physical exchanges with terrain, and therefore with the places and territories they are part of. An additional complexity raised by the concept of terrain is that, in, as in the case of wildfires, it is entangled with and inseparable from the idea of nature. A well-known problem with the concept of nature is that its modernist baggage implies an ontological separation between humans and nature, or between society and nature, and the assumptions that, that humans are somehow external to nature rather than part of it. In thinking about terrain, this distinction collapses, for forests and mountains are as much a part of the terrain as buildings or roads are. And this is clear during wildfires, which engage with trees and houses as combustible components of terrain. Analyzing how wildfires are either empowered or contained by the forms, flows, atmospheric temperatures, and levels of humidity of terrain reveals those spatial dimensions of the climate crisis that cannot be fully accounted for by the concepts of place and territory. The spread of wildfire follows uh, first the loss of physics and what John Vyland in his book Fire Weather calls the fire triangle. And I quote, for all that matters to fire is fuel, weather, and topography. Weather conditions regarding high temperatures, low humidity, and intense dryness are certainly crucial to ignite wildfires, which make specialists talk of indeed fire weather. Wind is another powerful factor in shaping the intensity, trajectory, and velocity of wildfires. But an, an aerial component of the Earth's terrain, wind is also profoundly affected by landforms such as hills or creeks. And since the wildfire, and I quote Valiant again, gains and loses energy in direct relation to the sun's presence and strength, it tends to lie low at night and gain intensity at, at daytime when temperatures rise. And I quote again, the warming air and earth in turn generates breezes, particularly in hilly terrain like that along the Athabasca River on whose shores Fort McMurray is located, where the warmer sunlit hilltops draw cooler air upward out of the shaded river valleys, unquote. The wind thus produced out of this rugged terrain increased the potency of the wildfire that destroyed much of this town. <clears throat> 
like other major wildfires in the 21st century, the one in Fort McMurray adopted an intensity and behavior that were unprecedented and even generated fire tornadoes due to the extreme dryness of the forest, the very low humidity, and the very high temperatures in the region. Another factor that captures the distinct materiality of terrain in relation to the shifting and contingent nature of places and territories is the fact that the, the, that the planet's terrain forms a material continuum that allows the smoke of wildfires in Canada to travel far and wide, carried over by wind, reaching as far as Europe and the southern United States. This contrasts with the discontinuous nature of places and territories, which, while interconnected in multiple ways, are also demarcated by local specificities and technologies of policing and separation. The spatial continuum of the planet's terrain reminds us that uh, human actors may experience places and territories differently, but that they all share an atmosphere that is universal in nature and that is accumulating carbon dioxide and heating up everywhere. This is why while human uh, actors inhabit places that are also territories and that are also part of the materiality of the planet, these three concepts are not identical with each other. Each accounts for something that the other two don't. But what is the, na what is the nature of this entanglement? In an important essay on Lefebvre's triad, Christian Schmidt argues, and I quote, the three dimensions of the production of space have to be understood as being fundamentally of equal value. Space is at once perceived, conceived, and lived. None of these dimensions can be posited as the absolute origin, as thesis, and none is privileged." Unquote. At one level, something similar can be said of the triad explored in this presentation. Every place inhabited by humans is simultaneously part of territories and part of the planet's terrain, and each of these three concepts allows us to appreciate different dimensions of a unified set of social, political, and planetary phenomena. Yet Schmidt makes an additional and important point, which confirms why Lefebvre's triad constitutes a triadic dialectic. The fact that these three moments, and I quote Schmidt, relate to each other in varying relationships and complex movements, wherein now one, now the other prevail against the negation of one or the other, unquote. In thinking wildfires in Canada through the place, territory, terrain triad, we can see a similar pattern. In certain moments, territory seems to take precedence over place and terrain, like when an evacuation order mobilizes the power of the state, or when indigenous notions of territory challenge those orders. In other moments, place seems to come to the fore, as when residents mourn places that were reduced to ashes. Yet in many other moments, the power of terrain prevails, as when wildfires created by fire weather on parched forests overwhelm territorial practices and burn places to the ground. The grim reality of the climate crisis shows that within this triadic tri interface, the long-term trajectory in which we are immersed questions the idea that place, territory, and terrain are ontologically equivalent. The reason is simple. We know that if carbon emissions are not radically curved and if global temperatures continue rising, places and territories organized by human actors will eventually be obliterated by the determinant power of the planet's terrain. If anything, the climate crisis is teaching us that whereas places and territories imply human experiences and actions, terrain does not. Schmidt, in fact, notes something important about Lefebvre's triad that takes us toward a more materialist interpretation of his triad. And I quote Schmidt here, material social practice taking as the starting point of life and of analysis constitutes the first moment of this triad. This brings to mind Marx's famous argument in the Grundris about the dialectic mobilizing another triad, the one formed by production, circulation, and consumption. Farms argue that production, circulation, and consumption are dialectically imbricated and inseparable from each other. Yet he also warned against Hegelians that these moments are not identical and that the starting point and the moment when the cycle begins anew is production. Something similar could be said about the place-territory triad, a terrain triad. 
while they are inseparable and places and territories can indeed generate powerful social and political agencies, the process starts anew in terrain, given that places and territories are humanly defined and ultimately fleeting events. In the ecological approach to visual perception, James uh, Gibson wrote, the organism depends on its environment for its life, but the environment does not depend on the organism for its existence, unquote. Likewise, we could argue that whereas places and territories depend on the planet's terrain for their immersions and ongoing reproduction, the opposite is not the case, for the Earth does not depend on human places and territories for its existence. This is why analyzing places and territories through a non-anthropocentric perspective means acknowledging the generative void that defines the planet's terrain, by which I do not mean nothingness, but rather those more than human materialities and forces that escape human experiences and appropriations. Even some, some of the most humanist defenders of the power of place acknowledge this void, as when Edward Casey writes, and I quote, even the most culturally saturated the places retains a factor of wildness, that is, of the radically amorphous and unaccounted for, something that is not so much immune to culture as alien to it in its very midst. This ontological wildness ensures that cultural analysis never exhausts a given place." Unquote. What, what Casey calls the constitutive wildness of places could be more accurately defined as the voiding of place by the power of terrain, an unsettling exteriority to human capture embodied in the debris of homes and forests destroyed by wildfires. The ontological primacy of the terrain of planet Earth as prior and posterior to human-made places and territories, however, does not mean that terrain is a more important category than the latter two. If anything, this materialist axiom about the finitude of human agency in the context of the climate crisis should be a call for further politicizing our notions of place and territory. A spatial triad attuned not only to the climate crisis, but also, and more importantly, to the efforts to avert a climate catastrophe would in fact entail primarily a radical refiguration of places and territories in relation to terrain. In the production of space, Lefebvre wrote, a revolution that does not produce a new space has not realized its full potential. Indeed, it has failed in that it has not changed uh, life itself. A social transformation to be truly revolutionary in character must manifest a creative capacity in its effects on daily life, on language, and on space." Unquote. Read in the context of the looming climate catastrophe and through the lens of a triad involving place, territory, and terrain, Lefebvre's call means that a truly emancipatory climate revolution will require a qualitative and profound transformation of places and territories, and especially their attunement to the challenging terrain of a warming world. Ruth Gilmore gives us a powerful vision of this revolutionary horizon when she wrote that freedom is a place, reminding us that freedom becomes a tangible reality only through the cultivation of places defined by relations of care, healing, reciprocity, and solidarity. The grassroots movements at the forefront of struggles for climate justice worldwide are in fact creatively redesigning and creating local places along these lines either by defending places from the ruination by extractive industries, by producing collective places defined by agroecological practices uh, and food sovereignty, or by redesigning urban places to facilitate low carbon forms of transportation. But these movements are also aware that for this process of place making to be uh, effective, it also needs to become a territorial project that challenges the current territorial hegemony of fossil capitalism. This is why territory has become the most salient concepts de deployed by social movements worldwide to name the spatiality of their struggles. In Canada, this is clear among the indigenous, mov indigenous movements defining their territory, defending their territory against the, expa the expansion of the fossil fuel industry embodied in the Wet'suwet'en blockades against the construction of pipelines in their Jinta or territory in British Columbia. <clears throat> 
Similarly, uh, similarly, territorial territory has become a crucial concept among the social movements I work with in Argentina, and in general among radical grassroots and feminist movements in Latin America. Territory names uh, those zones of conflict and contestation that mobilize bodily engagements with places and terrain, which feminist and indigenous activists from Central America developed further with the concept of cuerpo territorio, body territory, which highlights that territorial struggles are embodied processes of contestation. These politicized notions of territory emerging from grassroots struggles in the Americas are also worth noting because they are attentive to the material and more than human rhythms of terrain, be those of forests, rivers, mountains, or urban neighborhoods. And they also draw from an ancient spatial sensibility among rebels, guerrilla fighters, and revolutionaries worldwide who have long perceived of terrain as the ultimate weapon of the weak and have taken advantage of the textured forms and flows of mountains, forests, cities, squares, and streets to empower collective actions and defend themselves from repression. This is also why the climate struggles for the future and the very possibility that the idea of a climate revolution ceases to be a utopian dream will demand of the social movements fighting for climate justice a double attunement to terrain, attunement to the effects of, looming of, co of, the, of coming climate disruptions, and attunement to the powers of the earth to fight those setting the world on fire. Thank you. <laughs>